You go back to sleep and you wake up and do whatever you want to do. But if you take the red pill, you have to face the world and all its truths and see how deep the rabbit hole goes. In the movie Matrix, which that clip is from, uh, Neo chooses the red pill. Now, people who know me know that I am not a big TV watcher, nor am I a great movie goer. In fact, part of the job and the task of the former retired, I started to say old, but I'll say retired regional staff, <laughs> was to teach me, bring me up to speed on movies, because I'm just not a movie goer. But I confess to you that this movie, The Matrix, captured my attention. It was introduced to me by someone who loves this genre, because even if I was going to a movie, believe me, I would not choose a science fiction nor an action movie. As my brother would like to say, I'm a chick flick kind of girl. And so it is amazing to me that I have drawn, been drawn to this movie. But in this clip, what we see is this big choice that Neo makes. He makes a choice that sets his direction and would ultimately guide all the seemingly infinite little choices that he must face as he goes on his journey. The act of choosing is important. The act of choosing is very important. And one's ability to perceive differences between the options is a key factor in helping us choose one thing over another. We serve a God who gives us choice. We choose to serve God. In our text this morning, or actually, is it, yeah, it's still morning. <laughs> in our text today, in Deuteronomy, we find Moses at the end of a long, long speech. In fact, we find him at the end of a series of sermons that have lasted from chapter 1 through chapter 29. Now, clearly, Moses couldn't be a pastor or a primary teacher in a contemporary church because if he was, the first thing he would find out is that sermons that are that long will get you fired. And if they don't get you fired, sermons that long will it cause you to have at least two or three heated meetings with the deacon board or at least the pastoral relations committee. But I digress, but at the end, at this setting of this text, the children of Israel are at the Jordan River, and they are about to enter the Promised Land, a place for which their ancestors had sighed. This is a major turning point in their history of God's chosen people. They have come full circle. Their choices during the first part of the journey were so bad that they were caused to wander in the wilderness for 40 years in a trip that they probably could have done in one twentieth of the time. 40 years, a generation has died off, and now they are camped at the border of the land of promise, the land of milk and honey. And Moses, in his role as leader and teacher, who knows that his tenure is about to come to an end, Moses, who will not cross over into the promised land, Moses, who through, had some remarkable experiences with the children of Israel. And when I say remarkable, I mean remarkably good and remarkably bad. Moses, who knows and has been with these people, to paraphrase the commercial, the insurance commercial, a little bit, Moses, who knows something about these people because he's seen some things about these people. Moses knows about their strengths and their flaws, and because he has lived with them for all of this time, decades in fact, he indeed has a sense of things that might lure them. In my spiritual eye, I have the impression that Moses understands that the context and lifestyle of the people are about to change drastically. I'm not the only one to make this observation. There are many Old Testament scholars, among them Walter Brueggemann and James Newsom, who point out, and I quote, 
Moses knows that when Israel arrives in the promised land, they will be faced with alternative ethical options, alternative objects of trust, and alternative modes of power. Now, please don't get this alternative stuff confused with alternative facts. We are talking about choices. The scholar raises the question, will the prosperity and abundance of the new land <clears throat> seduce or lure the children of Israel out of its faith in Yahweh? Will they hold fast to the commandments or will they get Israelite amnesia and forget all of the things that they no longer want to adhere to? Now, you know that Israelite amnesia is something Baptist folks know something about because we often get Baptist amnesia. <laughs> When we decide that we are going to forget some things while we hold on to other things and we intentionally blot out things. And so Moses, in this situation, is about to impart some wisdom before they cross into this promised land. You see, he lays out clearly what the choice is for them. Like Morpheus, Morpheus in our movie clip this morning, he has a choice. It's not a red pill and a blue pill choice. It is a choice, choosing life and good and, and service to the one God or choosing death and adversity and bowing down to other gods. In verse 15, Moses teaches and preaches, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. And then in the next three verses, he goes on to describe what we call an if-then clause. In that next three verses, he begins to lay down the law in practical language. In the African-American church is the point where we would say, make it plain, so that they would understand in their everyday life what this really means. You see, Moses then goes on, to tell them, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God and walking in his ways and observing in his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and be numerous, and the Lord your God, our God, will bless you. But if your hearts turn away and you do not hear but are led astray, to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare today that you shall perish and you shall not live long. Moses is reminding the children of Israel of the big choices between life or death, between prosperity and, ad and adversity. And when we place this, this, this conversation, this, this teaching, this sermon into the context of the life of Israel, and into the context of the book of Deuteronomy, it's almost impossible not to note that the commandments to love God and to follow God's commandment and, and his decrees is also accompanied by a workbook-like series of examples to the community in what that really looks like in day-to-day -day life. You see, I believe that he spells out in no uncertain terms the ordinances and the things that must be done for people who claim that they love God and want to serve God. Now, I will confess to you that in this climate, in these days, preaching is a tough hill to climb. When you are Baptist, <laughs> and when we have so many different opinions, not only do we have different opinions about things, we have a polity that says it's all right to disagree with one another. <laughs> and so we understand that there are always conditions and, and things that are set before us. But I tell you, I don't know about you, but I can barely watch the news these days. And I can barely read the newspaper. And I can barely listen to the discourse that goes on at the level that is happening 
in our world and in our country. I had to get off my Facebook account. I'm sorry, I know Kim said, oh my God, no, she didn't. Yes, I did. I got off of my Facebook account because I recognized that although most of my friends are Christian, imagine that, they don't all agree about different things in the world. They don't agree about politics. They belong to different political parties, and they have different stance, and, and they have different lenses in which they see the world. And quite frankly, I just didn't realize how diverse my group was until they started fighting on my Facebook page. <laughs> I said, well, I can fix that. <laughs> I can stop playing this game. And so I did, and what I've been doing ever since this, this tension has been growing, as I preach, I thought I would do the same thing I tell all my rookie pastors. You know what a rookie, you know, new pastors, excuse me. Doesn't mean to be disrespectful. But you know, new pastors. You know, I said, listen, if something's going on in the church, there's a little tension, or you had a fight with the deacon board, or there's something going on, preach the lectionary. Don't pick no text, because if you pick a text, and people perceive that you have picked that text to use the pulpit as a way of advancing your agenda or your views or to spank them for something or another, not that that would ever happen here. <laughs> and not that it happens in our other churches, but just in case you know some other people tell them. That's not an appropriate use of the pulpit. And so I tell them, preach the lectionary text. Because the lectionary text is geared to the church calendar and church year, and if God has something to say to God's people, God is brilliant enough, wide enough, experienced enough to break through and give the message that is needed for what you're preaching through the lectionary text. And so that's how I chose this text. Now, quite frankly, I was trying to stay out of trouble. You know I was. Because you know trouble is my middle name. <laughs> and I've been known to pick a text a time or two that let's just say may have inflamed one or another people. <laughs> but I was determined that I was going to do what God has called me to do, and that is preach the word. And that I would stick with the Bible, and I would cling to the verses, so that even if people got mad, I, the only thing I'd say to them is what I say is like this. I said, did anything I say was not biblical? That's a nice way of saying, bless your little heart. <laughs> Take your opinion, get your cup of coffee, and go to the fellowship hall. <laughs> because if I've said something that is not biblical, that is a place for us to begin. So I thought I was doing really well until I went to do my background research on this text and read the first 29 chapters. And I was trying to just figure out what it was that Moses was trying to teach the people and get them to review before they went into the promised land. And you know I don't want to be involved in all of the news lines and things that are going on, but here's what happened. In Deuteronomy 14, the text talks about, the Bible talks about sharing feasts with the hungry. Then in Deuteronomy 15, around the first through the 11th verse, it starts talking about canceling debts that the poor cannot pay. Then I turned to Deuteronomy 17. I skipped 16. I got nervous. I was switched over to 17, organizing government to guard against excessive wealth. Well, that didn't work out too well, so I just went on to chapter 23 where it started talking about sharing hospitality and runaway slaves. And if that wasn't bad enough, in 23 it went on to say no charging interest on loans to the covenant community. I went to chapter 24. And the Bible started talking about paying hired hands promptly what they earn. Mm. Like as in minimum wage, I'm thinking. Okay, leaving chapter 24 further on, leaving the residue of the harvest for the disadvantaged. And then in chapter 25, limiting the punishment in order to protect human dignity. I said, really, God? <laughs> this is a lectionary text that's going to keep me from getting in trouble? <laughs> in a time where we are looking at Muslim bans or not bans, in a time where we're having issues of immigration, in a time where our country is embattled, in a time, oh God, 
where someone would ask, where have all the prophets gone? And how on earth can we be the people of the God in the midst of chaos? I can understand why Moses did a crash course. I can understand why he would want to review for the children of Israel. I can understand that he wouldn't want them to accidentally forget whom they serve. I understand that he wanted the children of Israel not to succumb to things. I can understand that he would want them to remember that they once were slaves and refugees. I think Moses wanted them to remember what life was like for them as a people before they got to the land of milk and honey. You see, Moses wanted them to know that at that moment in their history, in their life, that everything was about to change. But the one thing that cannot change is the commitment to God and the promise to serve God. Now, some of you are looking at me and saying, you know what, she ain't said nothing about Jesus. <laughs> but you know, Jesus himself said that he didn't come to abolish the law. Amen? What did he come to do? He came to fulfill it. When Jesus himself was asked, what is the greatest of the commandments? His response was love God and love one another. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you do these two things, Jesus says, then all else will be all right. Because in reality, the commandments and, and the Ten Commandments and the commandments and decrees are the things that help us live together as God's people. I submit to you today that the process has not changed, nor has the big choice. Just like the children of Israel, contemporary Christians are still making choices. There are many of us here in this sanctuary today who have already made the big choice. We have decided to follow Jesus. We have confessed him Lord and Savior. We have dedicated our lives and do everything that we can that we might be the people that God is calling us to be. On the same token, there are some people in the congregation who may not have made that big choice yet. They haven't quite decided to choose. They, they, they're confused or they're just reluctant. They haven't found that moment. God uh, has not drawn them to the place where they have made that choice. But the truth of the matter of it is, is that we all have to make a choice. Either we're going to serve God or we're not. And so when we look at this text and when I look at what is facing contemporary Christians today, I'm going to go out on a limb and say even those of us who have already chosen, we're still having a problem connecting the dots. We're still having a problem identifying the way we should make those daily little decisions that prop up our big choice. You see, even the best choices are only as strong and only as good as the choices that stand beside it. You can't decide that you're going to be a neurosurgeon and then drop out of school. <laughs> you can't decide you're going to be the center of the basketball team and you're not going to pass the ball. You cannot decide on any big decision or big direction without accompanying a series of choices that embody and embrace where you're trying to go. Many of us have majored in knowing what Jesus would do and minored in what doing what Jesus did. There's a difference between knowing in your head what is right and what it is to follow God and actually doing it. My seminary professor used to say all the time, oh, you come to seminary to learn to talk the talk. But oh, brothers and sisters, you better learn how to walk the walk. Because we as Christians, whether we are in the pews or whether we are preaching, people are looking at us to embody that which we say we are and to reflect that whom we say we serve. We are created in God's image. The Imago Dei. 
And that has nothing to do with our physical bodies. I believe that to be created in the image of God simply means that we have the capacity to love and make the choices that God puts before us. That we can love endlessly as God has loved us. And so whoever you are, wherever you are, however much money you make, however much money you don't have, whatever your social uh, uh, economic status is, regardless of your political affiliation or what you've got going on in your life, when you claim the title Christian, you have made a decision, a choice to line your life up in the way and the will of God. In times like these, the world is so conflicted when our country is so divided, when there's no such thing as civil discourse. The text today serves as a reminder that where there is new beginnings or where there is shifts or where there's turning points, where we are confronted with changes in life, good or bad, we all need to review the connections between our big choice to be the people of God, to be the people of faith, to be followers of Jesus, people of the book, with the many daily choices that embrace the conditions that go hand in hand with that choice. If we cannot match these realities to our witness, we weaken our witness to the community and to the world. I tell you, if anyone should be able to work through some of the stuff that we are going through in the country, it should be Christian. Because we are the people who say we chose God and, and that we love one another. We are those people. And certainly we as Baptist people should know better than any other group what it means to agree to disagree. That we might move forward on the essential things that are important. When I look at this church, when I come here, I shared with someone today, I have no problem being transparent with my struggles when I'm here with you, when I'm preaching with you. I have no problem looking at your new uh, arrangement and, and what it embodies and what it, it symbolizes to me. This is my first visit since you finished the, the entryway, and I looked at it and I said, this is a place where God's people gather. This is a place where if a stranger comes, they can see a sign and know what door to go in. This is a place that has seats that can welcome a stranger. This is a place that regardless of your condition or your mental state, you can be welcome. This is a place where I find welcome. Not because of who I am, but because of whose I am. And because of who you are, you do the ministries that touch your community that touch the church life, the people around you in ways that reflect God. I came to encourage you today to continue to choose life by loving God. I want to encourage you today to choose to obey God and God's commandments and hold fast to God and God's biblical teachings because in times like these, we need more than ever the reference point, the mark, the foundation of our faith, our understanding of Jesus Christ and the love of God. I want to encourage you to choose God's son who died on a cross that we might have life and have life abundantly. If there's someone here today who has not made up their mind yet, or who for whatever reason has found themselves out of the ark of safety, you have decided that God might be all right, but God's people are just too much for you to handle. <laughs> so you have held back from making the choice. I want to encourage you to make the choice. Choose Jesus Christ. Choose God. Choose that which will bring you life, and not only life for you, but life for our descendants, for our grandchildren, for our great-grandchildren, 
for First Baptist Church of Mattoon 100 years from now, that they would look back and say in troubling times, every time there was troubling times, because this is not the first time we've been in troubling times. This is a church who chose God. I don't have a red pill or a blue pill, but I do have a choice to offer you. If you choose God, and I'm talking to those of you who may not know Jesus Christ, who may not know that whatever condition you're in, that Jesus has already paid the price for you to become a member of the family of God. I want to encourage you to choose life. Choose Christ. That you might have the tools you need to navigate the complexities and the crazy stuff that life will bring you. I choose life. I choose life because God chose me. Because God loved me first. Because God so loved the world. Not just Muriel, not just First Baptist Mattoon, not just Cleveland, not just Chicago, not just America. The scripture says that God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son. I choose life, and I came to encourage you to keep choosing, keep connecting, keep serving, not only for you, but for generations to come. I choose life. I choose to love God and all my neighbors. I choose life. <laughs> I want to include and invite the stranger, even the ones I don't like and don't understand. I choose life. I choose to fight for justice and fight against fear because the scripture tells me that perfect love casts out fear. I choose life so that I may embody, wherever I can, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. First Baptist Mattoon, my co-laborers in Christ, I plead with you, I beg with you to choose life, that we may do this together, that we may serve God, love God, serve our community, and be the people that God has called us to be. Amen? Gracious God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you, O oh God, for this family we call First Baptist Church of Mattoon. We pray right now, O oh God, that as we end this time together, that if there's one that is in this congregation who is being drawn to you, that they would seek this place and seek the leaders in this place. We ask, O oh God, that you would work with us and work through us. And we thank you for the privilege of life through your son, Jesus Christ. We have made up our mind, O oh God, and so we thank you for Jesus, and we thank you for this time together. Amen. We have decided to follow Jesus.